this idea that food and drugs can be compared. Can you give us an example of that where you've seen that food might have equal benefits, if not more benefits than a drug? Yeah, well, so we um, have been developing treatments for cancer that are designed to starve a cancer by cutting off its blood supply. And that's the process of angiogenesis that is hijacked by tumors, by cancer cells to get selfishly develop their own blood supply, right? So I told you the body has normal circulation to feed healthy tissues. Well, cancers can sometimes hijack that. So uh, one of the ways, new ways to treat cancer is actually to uh, give a drug that can intercept a cancer's ability to recruit a private blood supply. That's starving a cancer, cutting off its blood supply, can't get oxygen and nutrients, can't grow. Okay, so I, I was one of the people to help develop the systems to develop those drugs. There have been over a dozen drugs that have been approved by health authorities to be able to achieve this in colon cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, so on and so forth. Now, in that same system, we've actually thrown different food substances. And as an example, we took a drug uh, that is a, a designer drug to stop angiogenesis. And then we actually um, also threw blinded, so we didn't know what, which one was which, um, uh, a substance that turned out to be the powdered extract from just regular green tea, a cup of green tea. And we found that they were um, in that system, they went head to head against each other. And you could actually get the same effect in that test system. So now the question is, you know, um, we, we uh, looked at this in the lab. How does this actually play out in real people, in the real world? Well, uh, you know, there are studies now that show that even two to three cups of tea a day can lower your risk of developing ovarian cancer, for example, by up to 50%. This is a gigantic study in Europe called the EPIC study that have looked at all the different food patterns and and dietary consumptions over time to look for these correlations. And so food as medicine research is different from pharmaceutical research, okay? Pharmaceutical research, you take one pill or one drug and you get a group of people to make them as similar as possible. And then the only thing you do to, to people is give them that one drug and everything else is we hope to control it so that there's no other variables. Well, foods can't be studied like that. You can't give somebody only green tea to drink for, you know, months at a time, um, or a tomato to eat. That's the only thing that you can eat. And foods don't work like drugs. I mean, a drug, you could, you can squash a headache, you know, in 20 minutes with a powerful drug or a migraine. But with food, the benefits of food, because it's so much more natural and because it leverages your body's own defense systems, the benefits take time and they build up over time. And so you're talking about research studies that could take months or years even to fully appreciate just how beneficial that is. So this is how we do food as medicine research. We look for um, benefits in real populations of real people, like people drinking green tea. How well does that prevent different types of cancer? Then we back it up to say, can we run a small clinical trial, a small group of people that we can control to see if we get a similar effect? Then we go back into the lab and we kind of say, well, now what happens if you feed animals that actually with green tea, uh, to, like can we, you know, are an animal subject, um, can we actually see that benefit? Then we can even go deeper and go dive that, go start going that mile deep. What happens at the cellular level? What happens at the genetic level? And so food as medicine is really taking that macroscopic community-wide level view and then drilling it right down to that molecular pathway. And so I'm, I happen to be one of the people that actually can traverse that entire journey yeah. um, with, with what I've done. It's just so fascinating, very, very exciting about the future. That study you mentioned about um, a few cups of tea a day, reducing your risk of developing cancer. Um, was that black tea or green tea? It's green tea. Um, uh, but black tea actually also has um, different benefits uh, as well. So um, a study out of Italy did something really amazing. Well, so look, let's back up for a second. So <clears throat> what everybody would recognize is green tea, kind of like the kind of tea that you get in a sushi restaurant, Japanese restaurant, you know, uh, matcha. And it's very trendy. And, and of course, the trend goes back thousands of years in, in Asia. Um, uh, and then there's black tea, uh, classic English breakfast tea or Earl Grey tea. In fact, I have a little tin of it. I happen to have a tin, tin of Earl Grey tea here, right, right here. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I, I love tea. And most people have said, 
<clears throat> this was the thinking previously, that green tea is really great for you because it's green. It's got filled with antioxidants um, uh, and it's got all these polyphenols in it. And black tea, well, you know, when the British brought it back from Asia, they couldn't actually bring fresh green tea and with this long ocean voyage, so they fermented, and dried it. And that drying and fermenting actually destroys those polyphenols. So it doesn't have much good, like might taste good, but it doesn't really have the healthful properties. Well, this is where science, again, you know, is able to heat up that knife and cut through the, the, the butter to kind of see exactly what the story is. And it turns out that black tea actually is quite active. I studied uh, Chinese green tea, Japanese green tea, and, and studied um, Earl Grey. And we can, and so you can, besides comparing foods with drugs, you can compare foods with foods to find out which is the best kind. I was interested in is Japanese sencha or Chinese green tea, uh, jasmine tea, or is um, Earl Grey, which one is better when you throw them into the system? And we found actually surprisingly that Earl Grey, the black tea flavored bergamot, actually was the most potent tea when you combined all, when you looked at all three side by side. Other thing about black tea that's really amazing has been studied by researchers in Italy is that black tea actually can call out those stem cells from your bone marrow uh, to increase their levels in your circulation. And when your stem cells are circulating in your blood, uh, they come out of their hiding spots in your their storage uh, container, their, the, the garage that the paint, can, paint cans were stored in. They come out like bees flying out of a hive. And then they cir circulate in your body looking for organs to repair. So wherever you need a little bit of renewal, regeneration, your stem cells will fix it invisibly. Yeah. And so black tea can actually spark that repair and regenerative process. As you are describing these different foods and their actions, I keep thinking back to this list of five defense systems that I'm just fascinated by. And obviously, we, we spoke about DNA, number four. But you've now mentioned tea, I think, and, and, and green tea and black tea, it can impact stem cells, but it can also impact other parts of these defense systems. So presumably, are there some foods which only work on one defense system from, from the knowledge that we have so far and other foods which can kind of hit more and potentially all five at the same time? Yeah, well, so here's a principle of nature. Mother nature tends to be incredibly clever and pack multiple roles in any given food. So uh, while researchers may have only looked at one food in yeah. one particular way. So for example, CQ, uh, I'm trying to think about um, something that would be uh, useful um, from a whole food perspective that has only been found to do one thing. Actually, <clears throat> I have to say most of the foods that I know of that I've done research on, when you take a careful look, they can activate multiple health defenses. So I think that that's really where yeah. we're at is really peeling back and discovering the utility, the multi-pronged utility of different foods. That makes sense though, doesn't it? Because these defense systems, they don't work in isolation. They're sort of, they help, you know, work to, they, they obviously have to work as interconnected systems together. So it kind of makes sense that food, particularly food that's been around for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years are also going to have these multiple type effects. Yeah. You know, if, if we go to angiogenesis, which you've already mentioned, and that was the first health defense system that you talked us through, this I found really, really interesting when researching your work, uh, your TED talk, which of course has been viewed by millions of people now. There was a really interesting slide towards the end where I, I, I very much resonate with this idea. What's the root cause of multiple diseases? Can we, you know, address the root cause and then, you know, we're, we're automatically going to take care of multiple different downstream consequences? And that was a very powerful slide showing that when angiogenesis is working well or when it's not working well, what can happen in the body? Could you just talk us through, um, through that lens, angiogenesis, um, because I think that's really interesting. And then you also mentioned cancer and blood supply. And again, could you just talk to us about cancer and how it can only grow to a certain uh, size unless it gets its own blood supply as well, please? Yeah, sure. Our circulation is uh, uh, these blood vessels, this network, and the blood is really the vehicle 
that carries oxygen and nutrients and everything else that our cells need to survive. So when we have the right amount, all of our health, all of our organs are functioning properly. Um, sometimes we need a few extra blood vessels. So if you're working out and trying to build your muscles, when your muscles get bigger, it requires more blood vessels, a bigger blood supply, no problem. Your angiogenesis system can actually supply and help to grow more of those blood vessels, but they keep it in proper volume. So not too many, not too few blood vessels, very important principle of angiogenesis. That's health. We have good circulation. Now here's what happens in disease. When you don't have enough blood vessels, what are some of the <clears throat> typical diseases that uh, occur when you don't have enough blood flow? Well, one of the things uh, is um, after a heart attack, if you cannot grow enough blood vessels, your parts of your heart will get weaker. You can get heart failure, and and you and a heart attack can actually be even fatal if you don't have if you have inadequate blood vessels to try to bypass any temporary blockage. Same thing as a stroke. <clears throat> we know after there's a stroke, uh, sometimes a, a, a clot gets sent to the brain and results in that type of stroke. Your uh, angiogenesis defense system uh, is uh, scrambled to be able to immediately generate bypass, tiny little bypass muscles, get around that blockage to save the brain beyond the blockage. If you can't get enough blood vessels growing in that situation, parts of your brain die and, um, and you wind up being paralyzed or having deficits after a stroke. Um, in diabetes, uh, many people with diabetes lose their legs. They have their legs amputated, mostly because they have problems healing wounds on their feet. Yeah. Now, the reason is because they, their nerves actually become, they go numb. Their nerves die back, diabetic nephropathy, uh, neuropathy. And the reason that the nerves die back is because there's inadequate blood vessels feeding those nerves. So now in diabetes, some of those nerves in your feet and your, even your fingertips actually are, don't have enough blood supply. They die when the yeah. nerves die. You can't feel when you step on a pebble and you create a little hole, that hole gets infected. That wound now also won't heal because it doesn't have enough blood vessels. That's an example of inadequate angiogenesis and cause a problem. And so now medical treatments actually have been designed to actually try to stimulate more blood vessels to coax more vessels in where they're needed, but foods can also help do it as well. On the flip side, when you have too many blood vessels, and this is where cancer comes into play, it turns out that we all have cancer in our body. I mean, cancers, we fear, everyone fears cancer. The, the word actually, you know, causes a shiver to run down most people's spine. Yeah. Everyone knows somebody who's been touched by cancer. And I would say most people know somebody who's died of cancer, actually. And so this is actually one of the most fearsome diseases. But yet, biologically, we are actually all forming cancers in our body all the time, because all it takes for our 40 trillion cells to do is to make those little mistakes I told you 10,000 mistakes are fixed every day. A few of those going, uh, kind of getting stinking through will turn into a microscopic tumor, microscopic cancer. And this is called cancer without disease because a tiny little mutant cancer can grow up to the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen and then it's frozen like a pimple. It can't go any bigger because it doesn't have a blood supply, no oxygen, no food, nothing to feed it. And so those little microscopic cancers sit there until, our, until another one of our defense systems, our immune system, wings by like a cop on a beat and sees this abnormal cell sitting on that street corner in a good neighborhood and then says, get in the car, we're taking you away. And so our immune system destroys these microscopic cancers. But some cancers are able to, some microscopic cancers are able to hijack our body's regular angiogenesis defense system and selfishly grow blood vessels to feed themselves. Now, I worked in a lab studying angiogenesis, and we discovered that once an avascular or bloodless cancer is able to get vessels to touch it, the, the moment that that touches it, the cancer can grow 16,000 times in two weeks. So literally, angiogenesis out of control is a trigger, uh, an explosive trigger for tumor growth. And in fact, we know that if you can cut off the blood supply or prevent tumors from growing their blood supply, you can actually keep these cancers harmless for long periods of time. And so this is what foods are able to do. Foods that inhibit angiogenesis, they won't, they won't stop the good blood vessels from growing because good blood vessels are actually solidly locked into your body. 
your, your defense system ensures you're not going to get rid of your good blood vessels um, um, with food, but those extra blood vessels tend to be fragile. And those are the ones that, that, that the, the foods that we eat, and then if necessary, drugs that we can prescribe can really just kind of shear those extra vessels away. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.